millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am, but Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because, let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high-quality, grass-fed, and grass-finished beef, organic chicken, pork-raised crate-free, and wild-caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high-quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at ButcherBox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious, and all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips for free in every order for a year. Plus get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com etm. And use code ETM to choose your free offer and get $20 off. Everyone knows that putting money aside in savings is really important. But then what? Should you keep your savings locked in a CD for a higher rate or keep them liquid in a money market? Can your checking account help you save too? Or is it about creating the right combination? We believe real banking is a conversation. Let's talk about the savings options that are right for you. Learn more at sandyspringbank.com. Member FDIC. Do the saving that uh, you need to do. If you haven't started in your 20s, then you can start in your 30s. If you haven't started in your 30s, you can start in your 40s. If you haven't started in your 40s, you can still start in your 50s. Welcome to Everyone's Talking Money Podcast. I'm your host, Shauna Game. There's no judgment, no dumb questions, just smart conversations about you and your money. So come on in and grab a seat. Everyone is welcome here. When you take a peek at your retirement savings, on a scale of 1 to 10, how do you feel about how much you saved? Excited? freaked out, or maybe somewhere in between. All right, no matter how you feel about your retirement savings, the truth is the system was set up to work well for only a very small group of people. The American retirement system, according to our guest, Martin Bailey, author of the new book, The Retirement Challenge, is completely obsolete. So the logical question is, why did this happen? We were moving towards a system where everybody had a, a pension. Uh, we hadn't reached it. Only about a half people of people had of workers had pensions. Uh, but that's what the, the goal was, that everyone would have uh, a pension, work at a job, and then uh, retire and get a pension from that job. The system might not be the best, for sure. But saving for retirement is ultimately up to you. So in this episode, Martin shares the history and the future of our retirement system, what to do if you haven't saved as much as you would like to, and dives deep into the question of, will Social Security actually be here for me? More than anything, I think his advice here is what really matters. If you take the right steps, and it doesn't mean you have to do them today or tomorrow, but if you eventually take the right steps, you can ensure yourself 
a nice, secure retirement. That is within your grasp. Real quick before we jump into the conversation, I just want to talk to you about the sponsors of this podcast. You know, it's my job to bring you only the best companies and products that I believe will help you live a better life, save some time and money, and help you build and protect your cash. So to do that, I personally vet every single sponsor to make sure they are Shauna approved. These sponsors help keep this show free to you and allow us to bring on some amazing guests to help you on your money journey. So here's where you come in. I need you to do me a favor and like and support the sponsors on this show that you love so we can keep this podcast growing for years. You can find all the links in the show notes to all our sponsors, along with a special code for all of our ETM discounts and deals. Thanks so much, my friend. Into the episode we go. We have done a lot of episodes over the last eight years all about saving for retirement, but we really haven't done a deep dive into the retirement system as a whole. And I think this is such a fascinating topic and something that everybody needs to, to really learn about and understand how this works. And you say that the the retirement system is obsolete, that it only works for a small percentage of people. You have this this great book out called The Retirement Challenge, where you go really in depth of the retirement system. But just to start us out, Martin, you know, why is the retirement system obsolete? And why haven't there any been any changes made? Well, the retirement system is uh, obsolete. I guess that's a strong word, but we were moving towards a system where everybody had a, a pension. Uh, we hadn't reached it; only about a half people of people had of workers had pensions. Uh, but that's what the the goal was: that everyone would have uh, a pension, work at a job, and then uh, retire and get a pension from that job, and that would be then supplemented by Social Security and, to some extent, by private saving as well. That was the so-called three-legged stool of uh, retirement. But uh, companies are now, private companies certainly, and even to some extent the public sector, are really uh, getting rid of their pension programs. And so much more of retirement has really been pushed back onto families. We have families now have to make that decision to both save and then manage their retirement saving uh, so that they can uh, f- flourish during the retirement years. It's also the case that people are living longer, so uh, that has has been a change too. And when that shift was made, where you now have to, you know, take the onus on yourself to save for retirement, and I want to go deeper into that in just a little bit. But when that shift happened, um, what we're seeing, you, you know better th- than I do, but people are not saving for retirement. So they they have this option available and I know that the government's trying to do all sorts of things to try and figure out how to, you know, auto enroll people into retirement savings, but the numbers are showing that we're not saving. Is that is that correct? Well, some are, some aren't. Uh, certainly upper income people and even uh, some middle income people are doing pretty well at saving. And if you ask uh, how big is the kitty for retirement uh, saving, it's about uh, between 20 and $25 trillion uh, nationally. So there's quite a bit of money there. And then, of course, people, a lot of people own their own homes. And so that's an asset that can be used and people have other savings as well. So there are some people that are saving, but unfortunately, as you correctly say, uh, not everyone is saving. There are a lot of people that really don't have uh, very much money. Um, and even those that are saving in so-called 401k type plans, that's a, a plan that uh, works through saving uh, through your employer, uh, the average size of the of that amount is not very large. I think there was a report said for people over 65, the average amount was about $87,000, which doesn't going to get you very far in terms of uh, lasting a retirement for 20 or 30 years. Right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, yes, so people are saving. Some people are pretty well uh, looked after, um, but many people do not have enough in saving. And there is another problem that I'd, I'd like to address, which is that even those that are saving aren't necessarily feeling secure because they don't uh, know how long they're going to live, so how long their savings are going to have to last. Uh, they don't know about whether they're going to need uh, end-of-life care, whether they're going to need to go into a, a nursing home and how they're going to manage that. Um, so even um, even those that, and, and of course, the uncertainties of the 
equity markets, uh, as we've experienced in the last year or so, uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty, even for those that have saved. And even, uh, you know, we have a wide range of listeners on this show, people who are uh, just out of college and kind of getting started, and then people who are 50s and 60s and in nearing retirement. So we have we have a very wide range of listeners. Uh, but, you know, I'm thinking even um, younger, younger people who I've heard a, a lot from, you know, where they're like, they, let me take this over. So a lot of the younger listeners are uh, sending questions in and really curious about why should they start saving from a very young age? You know, most of them have seen what happened in 2008, 2009, and, you know, kind of the what just happened with the markets the last couple of years uh, coming out of COVID. And they, they're they really nervous about putting money away, uh, particularly invested in the stock market for retirement. And they're thinking, you know, if I'm in my 20s, why do I need to worry about saving for retirement now? What do you have to say to, to those that are younger that are listening? Well, uh, I hope, I'm, first of all, I'm glad that you're getting those inquiries and that uh, the people and your listeners are at least thinking about the problem and what they should uh, do about it. And I understand both the fact that uh, retirement seems a long way off. Nobody really wants to think about being 60, 70, or 80. Um, when you're young and active, and and uh, that's uh, that's far away, and and obviously the uncertainty in markets uh, makes people nervous. So I understand very much the comments that you're receiving. What I would say is, if you are able to set a bit aside every uh, every month or whenever you get a paycheck, and do that consistently. Maybe in your 20s, maybe you start in your 30s or even in your 40s if you haven't uh, started already. Um, that will put you in, in – uh, you'll be able to have a nice secure retirement. Um, obviously, we're going to talk about some of the other problems, but basically by saving consistently – over your lifetime, that will allow you to have that secure retirement. Now, if you're young, you've got a lot of other demands. Maybe you're getting married. Maybe you're having children. Uh, maybe you're building your career. Maybe you're changing careers, something like that. Those things obviously have to be taken into account. You have to uh, address all of those issues. Maybe you have uh, student loans to to pay off. So there are many other demands of on on saving. But if you can manage to just set a little bit aside, then there is this sort of magic of compound uh, interest uh, that allows that to accumulate over time. So that when you do come to retire, when you are ready to uh, end your career or or think about uh, uh, moving to something different. Uh, then you, you'll have that money uh, available. Now, the stock market does go up and down. Uh, obviously, that's, uh, that's unsettling. Um, but uh, in the long run, uh, the American stock market has done well. Yes, we've had big downturns as we did in 2009. And as we experienced uh, this past year, and even now, things are, are still fairly uncertain. But my message there, I think, is don't panic if the market uh, starts to go down. If you can hang in there, not pull money out, and just keep saving consistently, then you will, in the end, do well. In fact, when the market goes down, as it did uh, last year and has been uh, vacillating a bit this year, then if you're a young person, then saving uh, may actually uh, be a, that it's a good time to save because the chances are the market will eventually recover. I don't know when, uh, but I think it will eventually recover and you'll do well out of the money you've set aside. So kind of sticking along that that theme for here for a minute, you know, are there stages to to saving and planning for retirement when we're in our you know, 30s, 40s and 50s? Or are those years just all about Let's put as much money as we can into our retirement vehicles and, and save as much as we can in the system that we have available to us. Um, I think it's there are other priorities that need to be weighed. Uh, I don't want to sort of give very specific uh, advice as to how much you should save or how much you should put into other things. I think people, uh, you need to uh, maybe get some professional advice if you can, try to get some unbiased professional advice. Um, and then you need to weigh off. Um, do I want to buy a house? I think for most people, that's a good investment to, to make, that you can live in the house and then it will have value for you uh, going forward. 
Uh, obviously, if you have student loans, they will need to be uh, gradually uh, repaid. So I think uh, there aren't sort of a golden rule. Um, but if you've got a, uh, if you're in a job uh, where they're offering you a retirement plan, and hopefully it's a plan where the employer will make a matching contribution. So if you have an employer that will say, we'll match what you put in up to 5% of your salary, then I would strongly recommend that you put at least 5% into that uh, 401k or, or, or uh, there are other similar plans like 401k plans. So you, you certainly want to take advantage of the matches that uh, the employer provides. And even if the you don't have an employer that's matching, or if you need to set up your own IRA, maybe you're self-employed or working in the gig economy, then I think trying to uh, at least get a, a modest amount, uh, maybe 5% or so of your income uh, into that saving account and do that consistently. Because you do get one advantage, that those savings can occur out of pre-tax income. So the amount that's taken out of your paycheck or the amount that you set aside uh, from your earnings is um, will go straight into the, the saving pool uh, and doesn't cost you as much in terms of your actual take-home pay. So there is a tax break that you get associated with with it, as well as perhaps the match that your employer makes. I love that. Tax breaks and matches. <laughs> Two favorite words. Um, let's go back a little bit to to the retirement system. You, you talked about it being obsolete. I'm, I'm curious, Martin, what would a good retirement system look like? Uh, well, we think uh, the best approach is not to make uh, really drastic changes in our current system. I mean, there may be a case for some uh, drastic changes. There are people who think we should have a kind of national retirement like the Europeans uh, tend to do. Uh, but those uh, those have created problems in Europe in, in recent years. So we don't do that. And in any case, even if you do support that kind of more drastic uh, plan, it really is not going to go through Congress. So you have to be realistic. So the changes that, that we describe are, are ones that we think are feasible and that would make a great deal of difference. So the first one is making sure that everyone has access to a 401k type plan. It doesn't have to be 401k exactly, but but that idea. And that has actually been making some prog progress. Uh, we did see in the in recent legislation that there are greater incentives for companies to uh, set up such uh, such plans. So the number of plans should uh, increase. Um, there are also uh, 12 states and the city of Seattle that uh, actually uh, provide for uh, their residents uh, a, a plan like that. So you can, um, you can save through that, uh, that system, the state system or the wow, city okay. uh, yeah. system. So um, th those are gradually coming. Uh, but at the moment, uh, it's only been about a half of uh, workers that have access to those plans. And we would like to see um, steps taken that, that uh, give, gave everyone access. Ideally, uh, we would like to see uh, the federal government set up a plan so that you can save uh, through that. And this would not be something where the federal government owns your money or anything. It would be done very separately, uh, actually, from the federal government, sort of like government employees have now the so-called TSP uh, plan. Um, but uh, that would allow ev any uh, American who wanted to have a retirement saving plan to be able to do it easily and uh, at reasonably low, uh, low cost. So that would be a big, big, big change. Uh, we also think, and again, there have been changes in the law uh, just recently that helped this along, um, that automatic enrollment in some of those uh, retirement uh, plans. So your employer just automatically, when you take the job, you're automatically enrolled in the retirement plan. If you decide that you don't want to belong to it, that's up to you. So you still have discretion to do that. Um, but you are enrolled automatically and you have to so-called opt out. That's a system that you may have heard of called nudge, where you, we're nudging people to, uh, to save towards saving and they can decide they don't want to, uh, want to do that. But we think that would, uh, help a lot. Um, one of the big things that needs to be done is to reform of the so-called entitlements. Um, and uh, sometimes I just sort of bang my head against the wall uh, because I don't see us making the kind of progress that we need to make in that direction. 
uh, Social Security and Medicare are, I think, uh, essential to our retirement system, and they actually have been uh, successful. They are big parts of the re- the big parts of the reason why our retirement system actually is not uh, is not too bad. Um, but uh, at the moment, as you know, Social Security will run out of money and Medicare will run out of uh, money. That doesn't actually mean that uh, people will stop getting benefits. I think there'll be some kind of uh, stopgap measure, even if the trust funds run dry. But it, it creates an uncertainty for people, a feeling that they can't rely on these uh, programs. And so I really wish Congress, both sides of the aisle, would get together and the, the sort of a conspiracy where nobody wants to adjust benefits. Nobody wants to raise taxes. And so we don't do anything about uh, getting these programs uh, under control and and making them secure for Americans. And I think that's a a great pity. And it is possible to do. We can make some modest adjustments. I'm not in favor of big cuts in these programs, but we can make some adjustments uh, in the cost of these programs that would be helpful. And then in the end, I think we may have to uh, raise the revenues a bit, which may mean uh, increasing the tax rate, the FICA tax rate, and then nobody wants to do that, but I don't see much of an alternative or, or else raising the cap, the the, the uh, salary at which uh, Social Security uh, cuts out. So I think we're going to have to do some unpopular things to uh, get those programs uh, on track. And obviously, uh, it's very hard to, to get uh, Washington sometimes to make do these unpopular <laughs> things. So, but But that would make a, a huge difference. And the other place that I've mentioned is uh, doing something about uh, the amount of uncertainty uh, faced by uh, people who retire. So one of the things that's been found is that people who retire with a decent nest egg, maybe they have half a million dollars or a million dollars, that's quite a bit of money. Um, What do they do with that when they retire? Right, yeah. Well, a lot of times they don't spend it. They hold on to it. Um, they sort of hoard it, if you like. Uh, so they're not uh, allowing themselves to live as comfortably as uh, they could, given the hard work that they've had and the amount that they've uh, saved. And why is that? Well, we actually don't have a definitive answer to it, but I think the most likely answer is that they're worried that, uh, A, that they don't know how long they're going to live. So there's uncertainty about longevity. Um, Am I going to live until uh, I'm 85 or 90 or 95? And will I need, therefore, all of this money later? And the second uh, thing, of course, is uh, will I need to go into a nursing home or, if not a nursing home, uh, have some kind of full-time a person come in and care for me uh, because I'm not able to look after myself. So people are are, uh, worried about that eventuality. And there are insurance markets that in principle ought to be able to solve that problem. One is to buy, uh, take at least part of your portfolio and uh, buy an annuity with it because that guarantees will last until you uh, until you die, perhaps until either you or your spouse, uh, both uh, you or your spouse die. So it covers both of you. Break down uh, for a second, um, Martin, if you will, what an annuity is for those who, who who maybe have never heard what that is. Well, an ordinary income annuity is something that you buy. You can uh, buy it uh, along the way so you can make it part of your uh, retirement package. Although, unfortunately, um, most employers don't uh, offer that as part of their retirement uh, 401k plans. We would like it if more did. But even if they don't, as you get to retirement, uh, you can then take part of your uh, retirement saving or all of it if you want to. But most people, I think, want to keep part of it um, uh, for their own control. And, and you can buy an annuity. And what that is, is you pay over a certain amount of money to um, an annuity company or an insurance company. And in return, they promise to pay you a certain amount of money uh, every quarter or every month. And so you basically are getting a paycheck uh, on a regular basis that lasts uh, throughout your life. And uh, that's a regular income uh, annuity. And uh, listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news 
Well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps. But I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet, finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. There are a lot of annuities sold, uh, unfortunately not not that many are of that form. There are annuities that uh, really are, uh, don't really take that form. They're really something that um, more rich people use to uh, to uh, uh, so that they can uh, cut back on their taxes. Um, and, and so it, the, the annuity market is not working the way it should. Go back a little bit to Social Security. And talk a little bit about Social Security. You know, I, I think for many of us, it feels like something that was sold, um, you know, particularly to our parents or our grandparents' generation as kind of this, you know, magic bullet that would provide um, retirement funds that, that would either make up for uh, what we were getting from our private pensions or that we had saved in our retirement plans. But as you mentioned, that Social Security is, is going to run dry. And I think. You know, you you talked about the sentiment that so many of us feel nervous. We're not sure what's going to happen when we get older. But there's a just sort of general um, misunderstanding of of what Social Security is, why why it was started, and maybe even a, like why is it why is it running out? Well, it actually was started um, not as a as a way. Well, it was started for complicated reasons. I mean, it was started um, by Roosevelt in the 1930s, and one of the motivations at the time uh, was to encourage older people to retire because retirement hadn't really gotten going as a concept that much uh, uh, in the by the 1930s. Uh, so that's not necessarily a good reason uh, today. Uh, also, it was. Um, uh, on the contrary, in fact, we may want to encourage people to uh, keep working a little bit longer to make sure they have. That's another way uh, to to get a more secure uh, retirement. Also, it was meant to be. Uh, I mentioned the three legged stool, so it was sort of meant to go along with uh, company pensions and uh, private or individual uh, savings uh, to form um, that 
that combination of things which would provide it for an adequate uh, retirement. So it wasn't necessarily set up to be the sole source of income for retirees, even though for a lot of retirees today or quite a few retirees today, it's their either their sole source of income or their uh, main source of income. Uh, so it's it's really sort of gone beyond, I think, what it was originally intended uh, for. Uh, remember, we did have reforms to Social Security. There was the Greenspan uh, Commission in the 1980s, and that was to put Social Security on an even keel for 75 years. Well, I can't quite do the arithmetic in my head. I'm not sure if we've gone 75 years. But, you know, he came, uh, Greenspan and the, and the commission came fairly close to setting it on track. Um, but it, it didn't anticipate those changes, didn't anticipate the fact that uh, the birth rate has declined as much as it has, and people are living longer. But it's really the decline in the birth rate that has uh, changed the circumstances. So there are now a lot fewer young people uh, that are paying taxes into the system uh, and a lot more people drawing benefits uh, out. So it, it was set up as a so-called pay-as-you-go system. So it wasn't set up where the amount that you paid in uh, it, it, it's not like the 401k. It's not really like a savings plan. It was that you pay taxes and then those taxes uh, from working people uh, are then used to pay the benefits to the retirees. So when there are more retirees and not as many workers, uh, that puts a big stress on the on the system. And we haven't really uh, learned to cope with that. And people are trying to uh, deal with that without uh, adjusting benefits or uh, without adjusting taxes adequately to deal with that situation. Right. So we just end up back at the same kind of mess <laughs> as we've been talking all about the retirement retirement system. We come back to politics and people, you know, are not wanting to do certain things. Um, I'm also wondering. You know, I have a lot of listeners who uh, wrote in during the pandemic who were nervous about continuing to put in their retirement plans because they just didn't know what was ahead. You know, we were watching the news and and reading articles and we just didn't know what was, was going to happen. And then, you know, 2021 came and we felt a little bit better. And then 2022, and a lot of people got nervous about being laid off from their jobs and not sure if they're going to be able to keep their job. And so they continue to kind of pull back from from saving for retirement. But I'm wondering from your from your expertise point of view, you know, have you seen COVID and the pandemic impact our retirement? Um, obviously, it's been a uh, huge and, and horrible event that has happened to us that we didn't anticipate anything uh, like this. And of course, the number of uh, deaths, uh, including, of course, uh, disproportionately among the elderly uh, population and the people in nursing homes. So it's really changed people's perceptions of of uh, the going into a nursing home because uh, that was where a lot of the, uh, the the deaths occurred. So it's it's really been just a, a terrible thing, and it's also, as you point out, uh, particularly in the early part of of the uh, when it first came along in 2020, a great many people lost their jobs. Um, I would point out that right now the unemployment rate is 3.9%, which is the lowest that it's been since 1969. Uh, so there are plenty of jobs. And I think looking forward, uh, in part because um, a lot of uh, older people are going to be retiring, uh, the demand for uh, workers is going to be pretty high. I I'm not going to say uh, we'd never have a recession. We might have a recession even this year. Uh, there will be ups and downs in the economy. Uh, but I think I would say to your uh, listeners uh, that the chances overall are going to be pretty good that employment uh, prospects are going to be uh, okay. Now, we, we have some longer term trends going on. So uh, we have a sort of a bifurcation in the labor market, if I can use that word, which is to say that um, some people are doing really well in the labor market and a lot of people are not doing uh, so well. So there's a split between uh, those that are making, you know, $15, $20 an hour and those that are making, um, you know, $500 an hour. And that's a, uh, that's a big split. But nevertheless, I think it's fair to say 
uh, that the demand for labor will be there. And if people can um, watch out for their skills, make sure maybe they update their skills, uh, make sure they know what jobs are available and, and perhaps uh, sometimes be prepared to move, uh, the labor market prospects uh, should be reasonably good going forward. Now, in terms of investments, we already mentioned that. Um, I don't think uh, anybody, and I don't like to make any specific predictions about what um, markets and and uh, uh, bonds are going to do. But I think if you hold a mix uh, of uh, equities and uh, bonds, uh, favoring equities in your young years and then gradually shifting more into uh, bonds as you get older, uh, that's a pretty good way of ensuring that if you save uh, a decent amount, then you will do, uh, you will have enough money when you retire. Well, one of the reasons I was so excited to chat with you is you have a vast experience in economics, as you've already uh, just, you know, delighted us with uh, so much information. You even had a stint in the Clinton administration. You've really seen close up how our economy can be all over the place, uh, especially the last couple of years. I'm, I'm wondering if you could share with, with everyone listening, you know, maybe what are some of your most impactful money lessons that you've learned over the years of, of working in the administrations um, and just you know studying everything about economics? Uh, gosh, that's a, a big question, and I'll uh, <laughs> try to do my uh, uh, best to uh, to answer you on that. Um, I think the the thing that's um, I, I think the thing I'd point to first of all is that I've always been uh, what's sometimes referred to as a, a neoclassical economist with a, a belief also that we need to use macroeconomic policy to keep things on an even keel. Um, in which uh, we we let people um, find the jobs that are best suited to them to make the investments that uh, they think are the right investments to make. Uh, people make decisions as individuals, as families, uh, that companies uh, seek out the best opportunities, both for profits and innovation and to improve their own productivity. And that's the the best way to run the economy and provide economic growth and provide the benefits for all of us. And I still fundamentally believe that. Um, but I'm also struck by the fact that as our economy changes, um, as the environment changes, uh, that there are ways in which we need to use uh, economic policy uh, to to help people uh improve the, the opportunities that they have so provide good education provide uh, training programs for people that need uh training um to um, i i mentioned the 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 nudge so nudging people towards uh making the right savings uh decisions so i think we need a combination of the benefits of the market system, which America has uh, really excelled at, uh, but also combined with uh, helping ordinary people and particularly, uh, I think, lower income people uh, that often don't have those opportunities, uh, giving them a helping hand. Well, tell us a little bit about your book, The Retirement Challenge. I can only imagine how long it probably took you to compile <laughs> all the data and, and write the book. Uh, tell us about you know your, your journey to, to write this, this big book that really encapsulates our retirement system. Well, uh, I've studied a number of different things. As you said, I had a stint in the Clinton administration. I also had a, a stint in one of the major uh, economic uh, consulting firms. So I've done some private sector uh, stuff and been in the government as well as uh, academia and at the Brookings Institution uh, where I am uh, now. And and the topics I've studied, uh, one of the main ones was uh, productivity, which is an understanding how it's one of the main drivers of economic uh, growth. And I, I I've always wanted to understand more about that and, and what we can do to improve uh, economic growth. But uh, I've been gradually getting older, as we all do, and uh, getting towards the end of my uh, career. And so I thought I'd like to do something that I 
felt was worthwhile and um, would uh, match with my own particular interests. So I linked up with uh, Ben Harris, who has uh, studied as a leading economist and who has studied uh, retirement issues for a long time. And uh, we got together and uh, with Brookings and uh, his position at the Kellogg School, which is uh, at Northwestern University, we ran a project which was supported by some foundations, uh, and we brought people in, uh, some of the leading uh, economists from around the country, around the world even, and had them talk about uh, some of these um, retirement issues. So we certainly didn't do it all ourselves. We decided to enlist some of the best minds in the business uh, and to learn from them. And that's uh, gone on over, uh, I forget really, about three years, I suppose, that went on. And when we were finished with that, we thought, well, we really should try to write up what we've learned in a book that we think may help ordinary people who are interested in these topics and uh, policymakers who are thinking about what changes uh, might be made. And so that's what led us to uh, put this uh, book together. So we were standing on the shoulders of of some experts. And uh, as you say, it was quite a bit of work to put it together. (laughs) I can only imagine. (laughs) Well, We've talked about so much, and yet I know we have we haven't even scratched the surface of of the retirement system and and changes. But I think we have a, a much better kind of grasp on um, the system we have, maybe why it's not working so well, and what we could do to to improve it. But for for everyone listening, I'm wondering if you could leave us with you know some some takeaways or some action steps how do we make the most out of our retirement plan or options that we have available to us given that the system might not be um you know the best for us but it, it it's what we've got right now how do we set ourselves up for success well um i can't resist uh, uh hoping that some of your readers will buy our book the retirement challenge uh i'm martin bailey and ben harris is my uh co-author but let me try to give you a less uh, uh self-centered uh answer to your <laughs> your your question um i wouldn't get too uh caught up with the idea that social security is going to fail the stock market's going to collapse uh and all that stuff I, I think that that those things will continue to provide support and that you need to take advantage of them. So uh, do the saving that uh, you need to do. If you haven't started in your 20s, then you can start in your 30s. If you haven't started in your 30s, you can start in your 40s. If you haven't started in your 40s, you can still start in your 50s. Another thing that we haven't mentioned I think is important is uh, don't uh, retire too early unless you really have a lot of money and you just just want to retire. But if if you're a little bit thin on your retirement uh, assets, uh, wait a while before you retire and don't start collecting Social Security too early. If you start at age 62, you don't get much money. If you wait until 67 or 70, you get quite a bit more money, more than 70%. A uh, higher benefit if you wait to age seventy compared to age sixty-two. So don't start, don't retire too early. Don't start collecting uh, social security uh, too early. And in fact, if you if you work a little bit longer, that also gives you a bit more time to save and a little bit less time to uh, have to uh, support through your uh, retirement savings. So that's important. And then the last thing I'd say is get some professional advice and have them really talk to you. Maybe um, I think your employers should do this uh, really is to get you, give you some advice about uh, how you need to make investments, what investments you should uh, follow. Uh, do you want to buy an annuity? Uh, do you want to buy a deferred annuity, which most people haven't heard of, but it's a, a useful thing? How do you want to use the value of your house? Because that's an important asset for you. And uh, you can either sell your house uh, when you retire, or you can uh, get out a reverse mortgage or something like that. How do you take best advantage of the value of your house? So how do you maximize um, those things? And, and, and what's your plan um, for long-term care if you need it? Do you need to take an insurance policy on that uh, too? Uh, and so those things. And then finally, for goodness sakes, Make sure the people you vote for 
are going to tackle the problems that we need uh, tackling. And those are not just the problems of old people. We've got a lot of problems of young people. But make sure that uh, you say to those uh, people that you're voting for, look, you need to uh, take a look at Social Security and Medicare and do something about them. Don't just say, oh, we're going to cut this or cut that. Or don't just say, oh, we're going to raise taxes. Let's do this in a sensible way and put those uh, programs on, a, on an even keel. You know, Martin, one, one last thing I, w- I want to ask you. And, you know, as, I, as I'm sitting here and I'm listening to your, your amazing advice, I'm also thinking that probably a lot of people, they get scared too when they think about retirement and all of the things that we have to think through. Maybe give us just a little, I don't know, words of wisdom or a little inspiration, you know, for listening to this conversation. And maybe we're feeling a little bit nervous as we can often do around money how do we how do we balance that so that we don't get caught up in those those emotions around money um well it's it's uh, it's hard not to get caught up in emotions around money and so i'm not uh, you know i i'm i think we all do that to some extent and and are concerned about it but i think the main thing to say is that if you take the right steps and it doesn't mean you have to do them today or tomorrow but if you eventually take the right steps you can ensure yourself a nice secure retirement that is within your grasp and have confidence in yourself um, may find out as much information as you can and see if you can make uh, good decisions. And if you do those things, you will have done the best you could. And I think in the end, you will have a secure retirement and you won't have to worry so much. Has your answer changed from my first question? How do you feel about how much you've saved for retirement? Still excited, freaked out, or still somewhere in between? What I love is that Martin is not telling you that you have to have saved X dollars by X date or age. Instead, his advice is just to start saving and stop worrying so much about, will Social Security be there? Will I have enough? And all of those other puzzling questions. Sure, you want to have enough saved to last you through retirement. So with a system that is obsolete, at the end of the day, you just got to do what's best for you and the best that you can. You can find Martin's book, The Retirement Challenge, on Amazon. And I have to say, it is definitely worth a read. As always, if you enjoyed this episode, share it with somebody else and help set them free a little bit from this idea that retirement is scary, right? Help invite them into this idea that the system is obsolete, so let's just do the best we can. As always, you can head to the show notes for all the links to my episode guest, as well as the sponsors who make this show possible. I'll see you back here in a few days for a brand new episode.